Okay, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, we're about to start in a minute or two. Okay, uh, almost ready. I'll share my screen. Uh, Veronica. Yep. Uh, we recording or do I need to start recording? Um, we are recording. recording. We are recording. Okay. All right. Okay, so I think uh, we're we'll begin then. So good morning, everyone. Uh, this is day two, session one, uh, Tuesday for some of us. Uh, and uh, this morning we're going to do a bit more about um, models and actually a lot more exercises this morning for you to try out Tellurium and try and build some little models, mainly as a means to get used to the uh, syntax for Tellurium, which I think is pretty straightforward. Um, so this will have a hard end at about five to and within about three hours, just under three hours, um, I have another talk to give at in three hours. So this will have a hard end at about, uh, well, my time, it'll be 10 to 11. So that's in a roughly three hours time. So uh, what I want to go over first is um, there's a slide. So I'm in day two, session one, model construction simulation. Um, which, which piece are you seeing? Are you seeing my... Are you seeing Google Drive or are you seeing? Uh, we see Google Drive. Of, okay, Google Drive. Okay, good. So I've got a um, slide here, Tellurium in a nutshell. Um, I just want to uh, brief, briefly show this. So this will uh, uh, summarize some of the things we, we did yesterday. So let's uh, let's go over this a little bit and maybe a few things there in here that you're, you're not familiar with. Okay, so. And so I want to emphasize a couple of things. Uh, Tellurium is a, is, a, um, is a package that includes lots of other packages, okay? So it's a Python package, but it includes lots of other packages. So one of them is, is Roadrunner or Lib Roadrunner. This is the simulator, which understands SPML. And then the other one that's of interest is Antimony. This is the little scripting language that lets you easily write uh, models, okay? So those are the two main ones we need to know about. Uh, you'll hear about some others uh, later on in the in the week. Okay, so we've already done this. You've already downloaded it. You've seen this picture from Veronica showing the basic structure of Tellurium and the various things it supplies. Um, so we'll be covering some more of this this morning. And as a first example, this was you saw something like this yesterday. This is a really simple example on how to uh, run a simulation. Um, and just to show you quickly, I'll I've got um, something set up here. I just set this up this morning. So 
what you have to remember, of course, when you start a new session in Colab, uh, I think it probably wipes what you had yesterday. And so you have to reinstall Tellurium. Now, obviously, if you're running this from the desktop, you don't have to do this every time because it'll always be your desktop. But these are Google servers you're running on, and they um, shut them down uh, once you close your Colab. So you have to reinstall. Then uh, we import, okay, we import Tellurium, and I have a shortened version as TE. And here's a really quick, this is probably the smallest model you, you, wanna, you want to build. Uh, it's just one line. Uh, it's got uh, two species, S1 and S2. S1 gets converted to S2. And then the rate law is K1 times S1. K1 is the rate constant. S1 is the concentration of S1. Then initialize K1 to 0.1 and S1 to 10. I've not specified the units here, but you have to have in your mind what you think these units are. So you put a 10 here for some reason, uh, presumably because you know it's either you know millimolar or micromolar or whatever. And your rate constant will also have some kind of time units, which you know in your head what they are. The important thing to bear in mind is whenever, whatever you use, whatever units you use, be consistent throughout the model. So you can't mix units. And uh, then I'm gonna to come to do a simulation. Yeah, this is something, um, so let me, let me rerun this. So this is low, that's loaded the model, okay? And I wanna show you a couple of things. If I go R dot, it brings up all the possible methods I can execute, right? There's lots of them here. What we're looking for is simulate. So if I go, if I type S, you see there's a couple of things here. Uh, starting with S and one of them is simulate. And I can type simulate and if I want more help on it, uh, I think I can either open the brackets and it gives me some help here and I can scroll up and down, find out what's more about it. Or I can do put a question mark and then uh, enter that and the help will appear on the, well I did it before, but the help will appear on the right hand side. Okay, so there's pl plenty of help. Um, okay, so let's do a simulation then. Let's go M equals, now, by the way, you don't have to assign anything to simulate. Unless you want to see the actual numbers, you don't need to assign anything to simulate, but we'll have a look at the numbers coming back. Um, you don't, actually don't even have to put anything there either. There's, a, there's some defaults. I can't remember what the defaults are now, but I think it's something like, actually does it say here at all? Um, yeah, the default is start is zero. N, n time is five and the number of points is 51, okay? Uh, that's sometimes too small. The time end is sometimes too small. So I'll push it up to uh, 50 and I'll do 100 points, okay? Uh, let me just show you what happens if I just do 10 points, okay? So I'll run that and then I can just plot it. Okay, and then I get the plot. So you notice I only did 10 points, which means you can see the straight lines in the, in the curve, if I did even fewer, let's say four, four points and then plotted that, actually I should do a reset first, shouldn't I? Reset it back to back to where it was and then do the plot. Uh, now you definitely see the straight edges that form the, uh, the data. Now, the reason why this is important is if you have something like an oscillations, it's important you have enough resolution so that you don't get strange artifacts coming in. Um, so you want at least a hundred points and, and then it'll look uh, pretty reasonable. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, that's what I just showed you on this slide here. Where is it? There, this one. So this is a little bit of a longer model. It's got uh, two steps instead of one. S, it's a little, sort of a little linear chain, S1 to S2, S2 to S, S2 to S3. These rate laws here, you can put in whatever you want. I am, you're not restricted as long as, as long as it's a normal expression, you can put whatever you want there. Um, okay, and what happens internally is that this model gets converted into a set of differential equations for you, all right? So in this case, this little model here, which is the one we just did, uh, we get a differential equation for ds by dt and a differential equation for ds2 by dt. All right? And that's what it, it, it evaluates internally and then solves them, uh, for those of you interested, it solves them using CVOD, which is a stiff solver from the Sundials library suite. Uh, and that's just an example of multiple reactions. Again, with multiple reactions, it generates all the necessary ODs that you need for that model. Okay. 
Um, and I said, you can have, you know, more complicated rate laws. This is a reversible, Michael, uh, reversible mass action. And this is a Michaelis Menton, which we'll, we'll mention later this morning. Uh, and I put a comment on the end then to remind myself what they are. This can be useful to add comments to your model. Uh, so, uh, and they are, okay, so this example shows you, so at the moment we've all we've had um, unimolecular reactions. So one reactant on the left and one product on the right. But it's, it's, there's no problem having, you know, bimolecular reactions, trimolecular reactions, or as many as you want. So here we have S1 combines with S2 to form S3. Um, I've extended the rate law to include S2 as well as S1. And then this one is dissociation. S3 breaks down into S2, S4 molecules, in fact. S4 plus S4, and there's the rate law for that. So you can, there's quite a bit of flexibility on the kinds of reactions you can add. Um, you can add any, any size, any number of reactants or products on the left or right that you, that you need. Um, so one thing we haven't mentioned much is this idea of fixed species. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a quick, I'm going to run a simulation to illustrate this, okay? So let's come back to here. Let's add a new model here. So, oops, sorry. So I'm going to extend this to a couple of lines, okay? So let's put that down here. I don't need a semicolon at the end. So I'm going to go S2 goes to S3 and then K2 times S2. And then here I need to initialize K2 um, to, let's see, point, you know, 0.05. So if I run this, okay. I don't need the, re you oops, need what happened there? Uh, you need a semicolon after the whoopsie. 0.05. Whoopsie. There you go. <laughs> whoopsie. There you go. So you do that. There you go. There you went. I don't need the reset anymore. Uh, run that simulation. Run the plot. Now, if running the plot, I should get three lines on the other three lines. Uh, now we can see that things still seem to be happening after time 50. So let me extend that to 100. Okay. Uh, this time I do need to uh, reload the model. That's equivalent to doing a reset in some sense. Uh, and then replot. Okay, that's a bit better. So one thing you've noticed is that both S1 and S2 seem to tend to zero, and then S3 tends to a maximum, and that maximum corresponds to the original maximum of S1. So what's happened is all the mass has moved from S1 to S3. Now, the other thing I can do is I can look at the reaction rates and see what they're doing. And to do that, I can name my reaction. So I'm going to name the first reaction J1, name the second reaction J2. Okay, I'll run that. And this time I'm going to um, plot the reactions. Okay, so J1, I'm going to plot the, the reaction rates for J1 and J2. So I'll run that. So I'll only have two lines coming up now. So there they are. J1 and J2. So these are the reaction rates for reaction one and two. And you notice they both tend to zero. So this is not a very interesting model because everything sort of dies. Uh, all reaction rates tend to zero. All, all the mass ends up in the end. And then the whole thing is uh, nothing more ever happens. And nothing is actually happening in the pathway either. This is what we call sort of thermodynamic death. <laughs> um, it's not what living organisms do. Uh, Hopefully, you know, my, fl my fluxes won't go to zero for a while yet, uh, but one day they will. Um, but at the moment, they're, they're all, all my enzymes are running and there are reaction rates running through them that are non-zero. So how can I simulate, you know, a real living organism in that sense? What I have to do is I have to fix the boundaries because if you think of yourself, you know, as a human being, you're breathing in oxygen and that oxygen in the atmosphere is relatively constant. Uh, you eat probably two or three meals a day. You do that every day, seven days a week. So your food intake is relatively constant. Uh, and so in other words, your environment is relatively constant. And we need to do the same thing with our models. And so the environment here would be S1 and S3. Those are the two ends of the pathway, okay? And so I need to keep those uh, fixed if I want to simulate the kind of thing that a living organism experiences. And there are two ways to do it. 
the quick way is just to put a dollar in front of the species and that tells the uh, program that these are, these are actually fixed okay and will not change what happens internally it just doesn't generate a differential equation for s1 and s2 s3 okay s1 and s3 so let's run this and see what happens there's the cursor run that run that and then run the plot okay so now you see something quite different so now all the rates, so the first rate seems to be stuck at one. Well, that makes sense because the rate is determined by K1, a constant, and S1 is now fixed. And S1 is 10. So 10 times K1, which is 0.1, is one. So the input rate is fixed at one, which is why we see the blue line here just fixed at one. S2 on the other hand, uh, sorry, J2 on the other hand, starts at zero, then rises, and of course reaches the same level as J1 as it approaches steady state. So here we have the both rates are non-zero. And what we've got here is we're in a, in a state called the steady state. Let me um, plot the um, concentrations instead. Let's run that cell, run that cell, run that cell. And now you see something different as well with the species. There's only one species now. It doesn't plot. It doesn't bother to plot the fixed ones uh, because they they don't change. So that's not those are not very interesting. But it plots S two, which is here, which is the one in the middle, which doesn't have a dollar in front of it, and which we refer to as a floating species. So it's allowed to change, and you can see it changes. It starts from zero and it rises monotonically until it reaches a maximum here. And that maximum, which is, I don't know what it is, roughly about 20, is the steady state level of S2, okay? So this is something you'll be doing all the time right, with your models. You'll always be adding some kind of fixed boundary to your model. If you don't, the model will just run down uh, and won't do anything, okay? I said there were two ways of doing this. One way was to put a dollar in front. The other way, which is a more explicit and perhaps more readable, is you can type, you can see that S1 and S2 are, oh, sorry, S3 are external, all right? So if I run this one, run that, run that, run that, and I get the same plot, okay? So you might prefer this because it's a little bit more explicit. It says, you know, to somebody who's looking at this for the first time, they see, oh yeah, ex external, S1 and S3 are external, they're fixed, okay? Just as an experiment, what happens if we just fix S1? Uh, if we do that, we get this. So what you're seeing here is S1, S2 is doing the same thing as it was doing before. But the y-axis has been rescaled. So it's doing the same thing as before reaching the steady state. But the value of S3 is actually going off to infinity. So there's nothing stopping it from going up and up and up and up and up, right? This step is irreversible. So there's no way for S3 to push back on S2. Uh, so S3, S2 just keeps feeding S3 and S3 grows and grows and grows and grows. Okay. All right. So let's go back to that. So this one shows fixing your species. That's a very important thing to remember, fixing species. And the other thing that was mentioned yesterday were events. And we'll have a bit more to say about events this morning. Um, so an event is some, some action that occurs either after a certain time or when a species reaches a certain level or when a reaction rate reaches a certain level or whatever you want to do, some condition. And then when that condition uh, happens, you want to apply some operation, which is some usually some expression like this. So in this case, what's happening here is at time greater than five, I multiply K2 by two. But the important thing to know about these events is that they only happen once. So once it exceeds five, it will uh, evaluate this expression and that's it, it won't do it anymore. It doesn't evaluate the expression all the time after five. That's why we use the word at. So, uh, so like in an oscillator or something, every every time if you had like S one greater than two and it oscillates up, up, above and below two, then it would trigger every time it went, it went oh. from false to true. Oh yes, that's a good point. So, yes, it's the transition it triggers on. It's, yes. it's the transition that triggers on. When good it transitions point. from false to true, the event fires. Ah. As as long as it stays true, then nothing happens. If it turns to false again and then turns to true again, yeah. then it will trigger a, a second time. 
That's a very good point. Yes, I forgot about that. That's right. It triggers it triggers on a, a true transition, false to true transition. So it could happen many times. I mean, if I what I could do with this model is, in fact, why don't we build something like this? You could just say like the sign of time is. Well, I was thinking what we could do yeah. is uh, at time. Oh yeah, at time. What we could do is we could put a species here. So if it's some species right. greater than five than that, and then if it's uh, one one thing you can do is if when a species reaches above a certain level, you set, reset it to lower again. Like a species that's going uh, yes, up, yes, yes, you reset yes, it yes. to low, and then it goes up and then hits the that's event right. and goes back low again. Yeah, let's do that. So I'm going to fix this, fix that three, and then I'm going to put an event in here at. Uh, so what do we do? S two greater than what was it you said you suggested? Uh, oh, I know. Yeah. So when S two is greater than ten, we push S two back to say one. Might be yeah. really mean here, right? So it wants to go up, but we keep pulling it back down. So if I if I run this and then plot, oh look, you see, you sort of get it's a poor man's version of an oscillator. Um, so what's happening is every time it exceeds ten, so there's the roughly ten, right? You notice that it's not, it it's a bit uneven. The reason for that is because I don't have enough points. So if I increase the number of points. Uh, it'll probably even out. Yeah, there you go. So, so when it reaches 10, we set S2 back to one. So it plummets back to back to one. Then it starts climbing again. When it hits 10 again, it plummets back to one and so on. And it keeps doing on that. All right. So that's a, that's actually quite a nice uh, example there. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that. Lucien. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, these events. Those are going to be very useful. And we'll have, we'll have a few more examples this morning. Um, I mentioned the idea that you can name reactions, right? You can name them whatever you want. I name them J1, J2, because uh, J is the symbol for flux, and we tend to call these things fluxes of steady state uh, when the system is, uh, yeah, when the system is intact like this. Um, uh, that's the same thing again. Um, uh, yeah, these are often the things I will I will import. This is just to show you the things I usually import. Obviously, Tellurium, NumPy, I often have NumPy. Sometimes I don't actually probably need Roadrunner, but it's a habit more than anything else. And I'm often wanting to do some more sophisticated plotting. So I bring in the uh, plot uh, library. OK. Um, OK, I think that's that. And that's plotting. I think that's about it. And we did mention something yesterday about changing values. I'll do that again just shortly. Uh, and then we did something about resetting. Yeah, resetting. I don't want to confuse you here, but there are actually three kinds of reset. Um, the most important ones for you are the reset and reset all. Uh, reset resets the floating species back to their initial conditions. That's why I was using reset to re restart the simulator. If you ever change parameters, though, um, as well, then you want to use reset all, and that resets parameters and the initial conditions. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, this one here is just an image of spider. I will talk a bit more about that on Thursday. This is what I have. Ha I tend. I uh, tend to use. I tend to use it on the desktop. But uh, everything is the same except it's not a notebook. That's all. Okay. And lots of documentation which we've mentioned already. Okay. Uh, let's go back to this one. So the main. Uh, the main one. So let's view there. Okay. So. Tellurium runs on pretty much any any Python system you want to you want to use. I mean, today we're using it on Colab, which uses Jupyter. Uh, you saw the screenshot of Spider. I know some people use PyCharm. Uh, you can use it through Anaconda, which is a common way of getting Python working on the Mac. And this is the Visual Studio Code icon. That's actually rather nice because it's got a full debugger. If you're used to source level debugging. And then Visual Studio Code is the one you want to use. Um, so, but I don't for for modeling. I don't often find the need for that. But if you're developing Python code, uh, Visual Studio Code is really handy. So what we have here is Tellurium, which is the overarching package. And then underneath that, we have lots of other packages, including Roadrunner, which is what does the actual simulation. And we exchange. We generate SPML. We can consume SPML, and because of that, any models you generate in 
uh, Tellurium, you'll be able to export to other platforms like Copazi, Vcell, um, PySB, uh, there's a whole bunch of them. So all these all these tools, you can interchange models. So you might use one tool for something because you like it. You might use another tool for something else because you like that. Okay. All right, so I mentioned the help. Okay, um, all you have to do is type type the name of something, then a dot, and it'll pop up with the um, uh, the help. All right, it'll tell you what the help is. That's really useful. Same happens with Spider. Most of these platforms do this. Uh, they have a lot of help. Uh, when you you type the name of something, then a dot, it'll come up with a whole bunch of other stuff that you can um, search on. Uh, there's lots of help. Most of these platforms support some kind of help. Uh, the common one that all of them have is a question mark. So if you put a question mark after the command, some kind of help will come up. That will sure tell you a bit more about uh, how to use it, um, which is very useful, um, especially for things like plotting. We've got some plotting functions like plot array, and it's hard to remember what options are available. Um, this will give you all the different options like the title, Y label, and it helps to remind you what kind of things you can um, use in the, in this particular function plot array. But the same happens for other functions too. Uh, yeah, in, in Spider, there's an extra bit where if you do Control I on the on a method, it'll give you a fancy um, layout, a fancy help to you, uh, so it'll look quite nice. So anyway, that's not so important. Okay, so um, what are, what are, what if you don't want to write? I mean, you have a lot of documentation. What happens if you don't want to write the documentation? You don't want to read the documentation. I mean, who reads documentation, right? Uh, we've got a bunch of cheat sheets. Uh, let me show you where they are. So if I go back here and then go up to lecture materials. So I'm in lecture materials, day one, two, three, four. In here, you'll see there's a cheat. There's a bunch of cheat sheets. Uh, the slides we just saw, saw is here as well. I got some Python cheat sheet, ah, cheats, cheats. It's a hard one to say, uh, but there are two cheat sheet sheets here. Uh, Tellurium cheat sheet, which uh, gives you a basic uh, rundown of the commands and what it can do. You know, like how, how to run a simulation. Some basic uh, antimony syntax, which can be useful for you. Uh, resetting models, exporting models, changing models, plotting, and so on. Uh, and there's some more advanced stuff here. That's that's quite handy, how to do some stochastic simulations. So that's a cheat sheet on Tellurium itself. And then we have a, a modeling cheat sheet, which gives you some um, sub tip, some, some, no, some information on modeling, like what is a mass action rate law. Um, actually, some of these looks pretty similar, doesn't it? Um, Mm, I think I'll have to update this. It has a few extra things like computing the steady state, but uh, I would need, I should update this one. Anyway, those cheat sheets are available to you. Uh, they might be more useful to you than all the documentation since you know a lot of people don't read documentation too much anyway. So we have the cheat sheets, okay? So that's one thing. Um, that's just the example of the cheat sheet. Cheat sheet, oh my goodness, it's a hard one to say. Uh, okay, so a couple of things. Just a reminder: we've done setting, setting, and getting values. Let me just show you this in in this one. So if I'm down here, I can go r dot um, was it k one, all right, and it gives me the value of k one point one. I can change k one if I want, you know, to point four five, all right, and then I could rerun the simulation and I would get something else. And I think you may have seen that yesterday. So that's that one. Very easy to change uh, parameter values. Um, and there's a whole bunch of commands that I use a lot. Um, we've seen load A, which lets you load an antimony file, simulate. Uh, we'll come to steady state uh, later later on. But there's a whole bunch of things that I use quite often. And um, so let me show let me show you some of these, for example. Uh, one thing you're often doing is checking on the names of things. So if I want the names of all the species, all the floating species, okay, oops. And then in this case, there's only one, okay, which is S2, okay. Um, but for bigger pathways, it can be really useful to get these lists. The other one is 
get the boundary species. Uh, so I'm using this help system here. Um, there should be two of those, S1 and S3, okay? I can get things like get the uh, rates, rates of change. Those are the dx by dt's. There's only one in this case. That's S2, it's point, point, uh, sorry, it's 4.1022. I can get the uh, reaction, reaction rates. There we go. There should be two of those. Right, 4.5 and 0.397. Um, what were the other ones I had? Um, get rates of change, get reaction rates. Uh, just to quickly show you here, you'll probably be seeing this later, but if you want the, if you really want the SPML, if you want the SPML, you can just go, I'll get SPML. Let me print it so it looks nicer. Oops, proper print. And there's the SPML in all its glory. So this thing you could save to a file and load it into Copazi or some other tool, okay? So these are the methods that I, I frequently use. There's a bunch of others. Um, I mean, there's a lot of other methods, um, but these are the, some of the ones I tend to use. Um, we've done some installation stuff. Um, I have a, a utilities package that with things that I use often. This is an example of installing the utility package. So we might do this later in an exercise. Uh, so it's the usual thing for um, Python, it's pip install. Install. So whenever you want to install a package in Python, you always use this command pip install, okay? And the nice thing is you can run these from, you don't have to get out of Python, you can run it from within Python. So you can run this, for example, inside the notebook and it'll install whatever, install whatever package you, 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 know, you, you need. Um, you have to put a little exclamation mark because that basically tells the notebook this has to be executed outside of Python so it can be installed, okay? Uh, same with, with Spider, some other tools, you don't have to put an exclamation mark. It's intelligent enough to recognize what you what you want to do, okay? So the TUtils contains a bunch of things like um, more plotting routines, uh, doing heat maps, 3D plots, uh, a simple parameter scan, uh, generating random networks, and I'll, I'll be showing you some of these uh, later on. So it's just general utilities that we've built up, you know, over time. Um, generating random networks is useful for testing purposes, which is why it's there. Uh, so yeah, in fact, this is an example. Um, in fact, why don't, why don't we why don't we do it? Uh, so let's go here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go pip install uh, tutils. Okay. I didn't do a minus quiet so just to show you, you know, how how chatty it can be when you're when you do a pip install, all right? So it throws all this stuff out, most of which is not of interest to most of you. But that's why we put minus q on these things, just to stop it uh, talking to us so much. So it's installing all these things. Some things it's already found. It's saying requirement already satisfied. Okay, it's there. So I can now import te utils. Okay. Right, there it is. Oh, it's just about doing it. It's still doing it. Oh, it's still doing it. Okay. Why is it downloading Roadrunner? Okay. Anyway, as it, I don't think it has installed it, has it? For some reason, it's downloading all the older Roadrunners. I guess it thinks it wants all the all the different copies uh, in version two. Okay, now it's on step. Okay, so it's apparently done it. Okay, that <laughs> took a bit of effort, uh, but it's done it. So now I can go. I can now use this. So tutils. Uh, oops. Let's see. Build networks. Uh, what have we got here? Uh, get random network, um, what are the methods? All right, so the number of species and number of reactions, everything else is optional. So let's have uh, five species and uh, 10 reactions. Uh, I'll put this in, uh, in something called net, okay? So it's done that, so let me print out net and you'll see what it looks like. Okay, so there's a random network, all right? So, and if I want, I can now actually load it into a uh, Roadrunner 
Okay, load into Roadrunner. Then I can do a simulation. Do a simulation, let's go up to, let's do that. I, I have no idea what this is gonna do, all right? Because it's a random network. And there it goes, all right? So that, that's what the random network did. So there's a bunch of utilities in TU tells like that that, too, uh, that can do you know extra things. Okay, so now uh, I think there's various questions coming in the chat. Uh, we're gonna change topics now and talk a little bit about kinetics. Uh, Oh yeah, there you go. Okay. Great. I think most of the questions have been yeah, answered. But, that's yeah. great. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about kinetics. And I mean, this is a big subject. This is like, you know, a couple of semesters worth of, of teaching at a university or college. So we're only gonna give you a sort of bird's eye view of enzyme kinetics. Um, but I mean, this is the bread and butter for model building. If you're ever going to build a you know cellular model, you'll have to invoke some kind of kinetics, even if, if it's just mass action kinetics. But there's a whole range of kinetic rate laws you can use, and of course, to the beginner, it's a bit daunting what I what they should use when they're building a model. So let me go to view. Okay, so what I've done here, I've got this diagram here, which I'll, I'll be bringing up every now and then. Um, it sort of categorizes the various kinds of rate laws that exist. So the one you're mostly familiar with uh, from today and yesterday is mass action kinetics. So that's the simplest, okay? Uh, those of you who've done a little bit of biochemistry will probably recognize Michaelis Menten kinetics. So this is basic enzyme kinetics. Um, some of you may have come across uh, Hill-based cooperative kinetics or the Hill equation, which gives you sigmoidal plots, uh, you know, those S-shaped plots. Um, there are more sophisticated versions of those. Um, this is the MWC and KNF models. These are the monoweimer changeur model and the Koshlin model. Um, these are a lot more complicated than the Hill-based ones. Uh, then we have various approximations, uh, which one could use. Um, like power laws and lin log. Uh, we won't say much about those. Uh, and then if everything, if, if, if you have no idea what to do, you can use these things called generalized enzyme kinetic laws, which, which were published in the last say five, six years. Hanacom and Leib uh, Leibermeister rate laws. If you're absolutely stuck and you know it's not mass action, you can always use one of these, okay? So these are generalized. They can be used in any situation. They try to cover all the bases. Um, they can be uh, quite useful if you're stuck. If you know a little bit more, if you have more information, you can always go for one of these, the michaelis menten type equation, uh, or one of these uh, Hill equations or um, mono weimer changeur equation, okay? So let's start with uh, the michaelis menten type equations. These are based on the idea that an enzyme E you know, binds to a substrate to form an enzyme substrate complex, which then unbinds to form free enzyme product, right? So this is the basic mechanism for an enzyme. And you can have, this, you can have two forms. You can have the, this irreversible one where the production of product is, is irreversible. The product can't go back to substrate. Uh, or you can have the more general one where product can go, substrate can go to product and product can go to substrate. Um, for things like enzyme assays, so the kinds of enzyme assays that hospitals do in their, in their labs basically use this, the top model, because they're always assuming that there's hardly any product formed so they can get away with uh, basing their models on this irreversible one. If you're doing a, a model of a, if you're doing some kind of model inside a cell, however, where there will be product present, uh, you're better off using the reversible one. All right, we'll come back to that in a minute. So you notice there are three constants here, K1, K minus one, K2. And for this one, there's another one, K minus two. Often we don't know these constants. And in fact, they're really difficult to, to measure actually. Uh, they've only been measured in, certain, in a small number of cases. And of course, it depends on the mechanism. I mean, some enzymes have a lot more complex mechanisms than this. And so it becomes really difficult to determine those. So instead, people have devised approximations. And the most famous one 
um, is the Michaelis Menten equation, which some of you might be familiar with. All right, so this is an approximation. You notice it only has two constants, Vm and Kd, whereas before we had three constants, uh, K1, K minus one, and K2. Um, where does it come from? It comes from, um, let, me, let me swap over here. It comes from the idea that certain assumptions are made. All right, these are approximations, so you make certain assumptions. And one assumption here, for example, is that the binding of enzyme to substrate from the complex is always in equilibrium. And if it's always in equilibrium, we can write down the equilibrium constant or the dissociation constant in this case for this reaction. And if you also invoke the fact that there's a total amount of enzyme in the system, you can combine these two equations of four and get a, an equation that tells you the, how the enzyme substrate concentration is a function of free substrate. And once you have that, you can then turn that into the michaelis menten equation. So these are approximations, okay? Um, the other approximation is this. This is a simulation of this system. Uh, you'll notice that, so this is time on the x-axis and concentration on y. The red one is the substrate. The, the black one is the product. You see the substrate slowly getting used up and the product forming. What's interesting to observe is that the enzyme substrate complex is relatively constant for a long time until eventually the substrate runs out and then it just drops off. So this constant feature is exploited in another approximation where it assumes that the, the rate of change of ES is constant and you can go and go in that route. And that's basically, you basically derive the rate of change for ES. You take the same system, right? You derive the rate of change for ES and you set this to zero and you can then obtain a solution for ES. If you do that, you get a pretty much exactly the same equation. It looks exactly the same. Now for more complex rate laws, they don't always look the same. If you do use the equilibrium assumption versus the steady state assumption. assumption. But it turns out the equilibrium assumption is much easier to work with. Um, but in the end, I, I'm not sure how much it matters because you, you pretty much get very similar, similar rate laws in both cases. I mean, if you take into account the errors in your data and the uncertainties in the model anyway, I'm not sure how much extra uncertainty this kind of thing brings in. Now, this is the irreversible case, all right? This is the irreversible case. There's no product in this equation, right? This is the one that you would use in an enzyme assay if you were designing an assay system in a hospital, right? That's the one you would use. Um, now, let's look at some of the properties of this simple version. Uh, the first thing is that the initial rate, uh, this reaction velocity here, is a linear function of the enzyme concentration. All right. So if I double the enzyme concentration, I double the rate. Okay. Uh, the more interesting one is the substrate level. If I plot the rate against the substrate level, I get this classic uh, hyperbolic curve where it saturates at high substrate. Those of you who've done biochemistry should be familiar with this. Um, you can also interpret the constant, the Km constant here, as the substrate concentration that gives you half the maximum velocity. Right? And the Vm that you saw here, the Vm is the maximum velocity that the uh, enzyme achieves. Okay. So uh, these are the basic two properties for that irreversible case. As I said before, uh, for rail models, unless you, you have some prior information, I would avoid the irreversible equation. It's been shown many times now that models that use reversible equations are much turn out to be much more accurate than ones that don't. In fact, there was a very nice study done, was it last year or the year before, the in vitro study where they reassembled a pathway in vitro, right? They took, they purified the enzymes out and then reassemble the metabolic pathway outside the cell. And they built a series of models to try to, they then made measure, they then did experiments and made measurements and all the metabolites over time. And they built a series of models to try that, that would match the experimental data. And the best model was the one that included uh, reversibility. All right. So it's actually quite important. Um, it's been shown in other studies as well that uh, reversibility is important, especially for metabolic models. And this is the uh, example. This just shows you what the reversible one looks like. Uh, it's got this minus sign here. Right? That's the minus product. 
that's the equilibrium constant and you have an extra term in the denominator which represents the saturation of byproduct. So this is the sort of reversible ends and rate law that you might use. Okay. Now, if you don't notice this has one, two, three, four constants, right? Um, you can get away with a, a simpler one where you just assume that the product competes with the substrate, but doesn't actually get converted to substrate, right? So that means that the product can bind to the enzyme, but, it, but that then doesn't result in product substrate formation. But by binding to the free enzyme, of course, it, it uh, captures some of the free enzymes so the substrate has less enzyme to, to bind to. And so the product acts as an inhibitor. Right? Those of you again who've done some biochemistry will recognize this as a competitive inhibitor. And you can simplify this then. This is now only three constants instead of four. You only have the Vmax, the Km, and then the Kp, which relates to the inhibition level of the, of the product. Right? So you can, you can get away with this one uh, if you uh, don't want to use this more complex one. Okay. And, and talking about inhibition, uh, this is a favorite topic for biochemists mainly because inhibitors are used to uh, get information about mechanism. But there are lots and lots of possible models for inhibition, um, how the inhibitor binds to the enzyme and so on. Uh, this is the generalized model, right? So I, so I is the inhibitor, right? And I can bind to free enzyme, can bind to complex and so on. Uh, it turns out there's a whole family tree of these models because you can take subsets of this general model and generate these, well, these subsets, okay? And the one we just looked at with the product acting as inhibitors, this one here called uh, pure competitive inhibition, okay? But there's a, and this is, this gets very confusing actually because the terminology is not great. So you've got competitive, uncompetitive, non-competitive, and it's <laughs> just the wording is not very clear in what they actually mean. Um, so it can get, get quite confusing, but, um, there are quite a few uh, inhibitor models um, that you can pick. And, and these ones tend to matter because they tend to affect the, the, the kinetics in different ways. So they can, they can matter. But these competitors are often uh, drugs, right? therapeutic drugs. So this is why this is of interest to um, biochemists. So for the competitive inhibitor, you can you can go through the similar derivation and you end up, and uh, we've seen this one before, this is the same as the product inhibition I just showed you before. Uh, this is just being re this is just rearranged. But you can have one of these for each one of these sub models, okay? And this is what it looks like if you plot, there's various ways to plot these inhibition um, rate laws. Uh, those of you done some biochemistry will recognize this as the line weaver Berg plot, which is one over V versus one over S. But you can also do log 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 plots, and you get uh, things like this. So each line here is at a different level of inhibitor. What you notice is that the reaction rate. Uh, this is half the reaction rate, so that should be the Km. So you notice that the Km changes as the inhibitor level changes. And that's one of the characteristics of a competitive inhi inhibition is that it changes the apparent Km. But you notice the Vmax, the maximum velocity is untouched. And when you look at these various submodels, they are characterized in fact by what, how they change the, the Km or the Vmax. And you can see those when you do these various plots. So, so that's the, the Michaelis-Menten group. Um, then there's the Hill base. So the Michaelis-Menten group give you sort of hyperbolic monotonic uh, plots. The Hill-based uh, equations give you sigmoidal, you know, S-shaped plots. And the most common one is the Hill equation. Right? Um, this is the the model, or this is the derivation if you're if you're interested. Um, but it basically gives you uh, you have a, an extra parameter n in the equation. And the bigger the n, the more severe the S shape, okay? So at low n, n is two, you only get a mild S shape in the curve. And when n is eight, you get a very uh, sharp change in S. So this gives you sigmoid behavior. So if you ever have a, have a system that exhibits, you know, S shape behavior, you can use the Hill equation. It's very commonly used for that kind of thing. Um, so that's just what it looks like here. And that's, this is the rate law itself, okay? Um, now there are more elaborate Hill equations. There are reversible ones as well. 
which you want to use probably in, in metabolic models. Um, but there are more elaborate hill hill based ones. I've just shown you uh, this simple irreversible one. Uh, back in the 60s, that's a long time ago for some of you, uh, there was a lot of work done on, you know, how do we account for cooperativity? How do we account for sigmoid behavior, that S-shaped behavior? And a whole bunch of models were generated, the most famous being the mono weinberg changer and the Koshland model called the sequential model. Um, these are based on having multiple states for the enzymes and the states are influenced by what binds to them and not binds to them. And you can go through all the, all the math and you can derive equations such as this one here that uh, describes these kinds of systems. Uh, yeah, basically this is sort of a, um, a diagram. So a lot of these, the, the, these models rely on the protein being a multima, either tetramer or dimer or whatever. And they can move between, they can move states. They can either be in this case, what's called a tense state, or they can move to the relaxed state. And that movement between the states is influenced by the binding of substrate or any regulators and so on. And you can go through all the algebra and you can derive the rate laws. This is a, this is a, this is a fairly elaborate version. This is a much simpler version, just a dimer. And the, the uh, what's up, the relaxed state. The relaxed state binds substrate, but the tense state doesn't. And you can go, as I said, you can work the algebra out for all these and you end up equations that, that look like that. This is a generalized one for a protein that has N subunits. This is N here. Uh, and this will give you um, sigmoid behavior. Um, now they, it's interesting that when you look at the Hill equation and this equation, the sigmoid plots look indistinguishable by I, but actually they're subtly different. Um, in fact, the sensitivities of these equations are quite different to changes in substrate. Um, it's not an area that's been really studied much, but uh, they look similar, but their responses actually are different. So there is some danger in just blindly using a Hill equation. Um, and if you have knowledge that the system works as a, you know, as a weimann changer model, then I would use that model. Uh, okay, I don't think we need to go any further. Anyway, that's what, that's what the plots look like, okay? And there's, uh, there's one parameter in this one. The more elaborate ones have additional parameters, but these parameters, in this case, L, determines the sigmoidicity, okay? So you get nice uh, sigmoid curves. As I said, these look like the Hill equation ones, right? But actually, there are subtle differences. Uh, okay, we don't need to do that. Okay, so that's the Weimann changer. And then we have these ones. If all else fails and you've no idea what's going on, you can use these generalized enzyme kinetic laws. And there's two groups that have developed these the Hanacomb and the Leibemeister. The Hanacomb is from South Africa and the Leibemeister is German. Both are great. Um, they make some assumptions, but you end up with these sort of generalized ones uh, like this. I mean, they look complicated, but they're, they're complicated because they're extensible to any number of substrates and products. So this, this product term, this is a big pie. This is a product term. This is a product term here. This product term refers to uh, the uh, number of substrates and products, okay? So alpha, alpha I is the ith substrate pi i is the ith product. So I could have any number of, of substrates and any number of products, okay? So you could, you could build these. So these are, the, these are some examples, uh, uni, uni, and bi, bi, and you can just, you know, you just grow them as you need to, okay? And there's the, the paper up there that talks about it. In fact, there's a whole PhD thesis, which is actually quite good, that goes through this whole uh, thing. Uh, they also generalize them to include cooperativity. Here you see the, the H there, the exponent that gives you cooperativity. Again, this is completely extensible to any number of substrate products. Uh, you can even go even crazier. You can put in uh, inhibitors and activators. So they're totally generalizable, right? So you can have as many inhibitors and activators as you want, as many substrates or products as you want, right? So. The Leibemeister ones are interesting for another reason. This is the other group in 2010. Uh, this is also 
good piece of work. Uh, this is the basic equation they present, or one of them anyway. What's interesting about it is it's modular. So they take this modular approach where each part corresponds to a different aspect of the rate law. So T, for example, includes all the thermodynamic terms, you know, the equilibrium constant kind of stuff. The, the uh, D includes the saturation term. This is the denominator that you saw on the michaelis menten equation. This is the saturation term. Uh, the D reg includes things like competitive inhibition, right? The non-allosteric regulation. And then the R reg includes all the, all the fancy allosteric regulation, the cooperativity and so on. And so you can plug, you know, you can, you know, you can plug these bits, bits of expressions in or take them out. Uh, and they're totally extensible. You can have as many substrates, as many uh, products as you want, as many regulators as you want. So they're extremely uh, flexible, okay? Yeah, so there's a question saying, you know, what, how would I, what would you do, what do you do if you don't know what rate law to use? If you don't, want, don't know what to do, you could always use a mass action rate law and see what the model does. I mean, all you want the model to do is to recapitulate your experimental data, okay? And if you can do that with mass action kinetics, then that's good enough, all right? Uh, if you find mass action kinetics are not sufficient, you can then try and go for one of these, um, the Leibermeister or the Hanekom models, right? And see if those are better, right? So um, you just have to try these. If you don't have any information, you just have to try these to see how well they work, right? So. And like, so like if you knew the, the enzyme in, in question was a tetramer or something, then you might say like, all right, that, that indicates that maybe I should try the Hill equation. Exactly, or, yeah. That's if you any sort of information you know about the system itself can sort of help. Yeah, pick. Uh, help you pick. Yeah, because you got a lot of choices here, right? <laughs> so, um, some people use these approximations. These are these are some of you may have come across a power law approximation, which is this. It's just every substrate is raised to an exponent. Um, these are only good though around uh, a particular operating point. So I don't know if you can see this graph here. Maybe I should uh, make it bigger. Um, oops. Let me show you here. So this is a series of approximations. Uh, so the the worst approximation is completely linear. So you pick an operating point, all right, around which your model is going to work. And so I picked this one at one. So you might pick linear. That's the worst one of all because above and below one it's not very good there's the power law you know it's a bit better there's the lin log which is a bit better and there's the michaelis menten which is in this case was exact so you get, get these varying approximations the problem with these approximations is they only work around whatever operating point you pick they're really bad once you go once you go outside this range so you have to be careful um with these uh approximations okay so um, my thing is I would either, I would pick mass action first, or as Lucian said, if you have some information, go for the one that's, that matches the information you have. If you don't have any information, try mass action kinetics first. If that doesn't, you know, uh, give you good, good, good matching to the experimental data, then go for a generalized one, right? So you can do something like that. Okay, so that's coming up to the hour. Uh, what we're going to do now is you can have a break, a uh, 10 minute break, and then we'll come back and do some exercises. Okay, so we'll see you at 10 minutes past the hour. <laughs> Would people prefer breakout rooms? Okay, we got it. And... No, that's fine by me. Try this, try this little puzzle then, so you can get this running. Okay, I got a message. Thanks. Is it Adia? Yep. 
Great. So if you have any problems, just throw questions up on the Slack or um, chat. The notebook should be in the correct place, by the way. Oh yeah, it is. Should we call it something else? Like examples. A demo or something. You know. Demo. <laughs> About the time you finally got it there, I also got a copy there. So I have a copy of <laughs> copy of hello. <laughs> Let's see, does it, uh, let's see if tellurium, tellurium is still there. Warning, this was not authored by Google. Hmm. Uh, okay. Oh, you have to reinstall them, okay. <clears throat> Just to run everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to look at tutils. You wanted to, for some reason, you wanted to download every version of Roadrunner since 2.0. That was odd. I, I was wondering if maybe it was trying to find a compatible version, like it downloaded 2.0.4 oh. and it didn't work, so it tried 2.0.3 and that didn't work, <laughs> so it tried Duo 2 or something. I, oh. I don't know. Okay. Let's take some funny stuff with NumPy. Not existing installation. Uninstalling 19.3. Hmm. I don't know what this to do. Restart runtime. It worked even without that. Yeah, it did. Me, yeah. yeah, it did. Anyway, yeah. Hmm. Let's go ahead. <clears throat> hmm, we should put some more utilities in there. Oh, we're still recording again. Did you want to pause? Yeah, we don't need to record this. Okay. And hopefully you've got to the state state. Or oh, there's a special method called, funnily enough, steady state. Okay. That takes you immediately to the steady state. So let me just show you. Let me just get rid of this. And I'll rerun this, okay? And then I'll ask for the rates of change. Uh, actually, let's run it for a little bit, so it makes it look looks makes it look a bit better. Let me run it for a little bit. I'll run it for say to one. Okay, two data points. I don't need much. And then I'll ask for the rate of change. Okay, so you see now these are the rate of change. These are the dx by dts. I think you sh you agree that this system is not in steady state. Okay, so if I now call the steady state function. <clears throat> And now ask for the get the rates of change. <clears throat> get rates of change. Zero, zero, zero. So it's actually found the steady state. So if, whenever you want to find the steady state, we have this special function that lets that will 
it does basically a, a special search to look for the steady state and it'll it'll find if it's there it'll find it if it's not it won't it'll tell you so for example uh let's say i had um this one right so uh, that when i left out uh, s2 i think it went to infinity right uh, i think did it can't remember now but anyway let's run this one and if I ask for the steady state, it'll actually come back with an error. That's because this system has no steady state. Again, you'll get this scary looking message, Jacobian matrix singular. It's, it's basically telling you, I could not find any steady state in this model, all right? And so that could mean one of two things. Either there really isn't a steady state or there's a problem with your model. I mean, it's often an indi indi indicates that there's a problem with your model as well, so. Okay, so that's a useful thing to know. So that's the steady state uh, function, all right? Um, beware, you can get nasty errors back if it fails to find the steady state. Uh, don't worry about how nasty the uh, message is. Just beware, that probably means there's a problem with your model, okay? All As right. someone points out, like oscill oscillating models also don't have steady states. Aha, uh -huh. or do or they? Or do they? Yes. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can turn this into an oscillating model. Uh, let's see. So what I'm going to do here, I'm adding a negative feedback using competitive, sort of competitive inhibition. Uh, negative feedback from S4, okay. And then we'll run that simulation. No, oh, I didn't like it. Oops. Oh yeah, that protecting me there. It says I never initialized KI. Okay, I'll initialize KI. Thank you, Roadrunner. Oops, hold on, it's paused. Came out of pause mode. Okay, it's out of pause mode. Uh, and then uh, let's do the plot. Uh, it's trying to oscillate. I can't, I'm not sure. I think I might have to, let me add another step. I think I need another step to make it go. And then this is, I don't need a semicolon there. This is S5, that's S5, and that's a K5. And then I need to initialize K5 equals uh, 0.1. Uh, let's see what happens now. Still not quite there. Let me see. I know, oh, I know what to do. Let's uh, put a hell, hell coefficient on it here. That'll get it going. And let me put that in here as 0.27. So, hmm, not quite. I'm just trying. Let me push it up a bit more. Normally this is, <laughs> it's, it's trying to oscillate. Actually, let's raise this one up as well. Hmm. Oh, actually, uh, no, I don't want to do that. Do I? that. That actually is correct. Yeah, okay. Let me do that. Let me push it up even more. I'm trying to get this thing to oscillate. When you want something to oscillate, it won't oscillate. Classic. What happens if I do that? So, no, it's got to be like that. Oh, I know what the problem is. I should have changed the feedback to S5. Now it'll ring like a bell. There you go. So I got an oscillator, okay? Pretty easy to make an oscillator with negative feedback. And the question was, does it have a steady state? It looks like it doesn't. But actually, what's interesting about oscillators, they actually are orbiting what's called an unstable steady state. And um, let me uh, let me do this. Let me instead, let me plot, um, let me do a phase plot, okay? Not a, sorry, let me do, yeah, let me do a phase plot. Uh, S2. So I'm plotting S1 against S2, okay? Uh, actually, that's not right. What happened there? Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm making a mistake. That should be S3. All right. Okay. I need a few more points maybe to make it look nice. Um, there we go. So you can see uh, it's there's an orbit here, and it appears to be, it seems to be orbiting around a, some central point. In fact, that central point you can get to by asking it for the steady state, actually. I know it's a, maybe a strange thing to, to call it the steady state, um, 
but it, there is a state where the rates of change are zero. Um, and the, that state is at, let's see, I was S2, um, 0.39. So uh, S2 is on the x-axis, so 0.39, so it's about there. So the, there's a steady state probably around there. The thing about this un, uh, steady state is it's unstable. Okay, it's what's called not a stable steady state. And you won't be able to stay there. Um, if you are exactly on it, you can stay there, but any slight movement and you'll start to diverge out and then start to oscillate, okay? Um, this is one of the nice things about uh, this, this steady state function. It'll, it'll find the unstable states. Uh, a time cost simulation won't be able to do that. Right? And there's one reason why we have, have this one there, all right? Any questions on that? I know that was a bit more of an advanced topic, but. Um, uh, there was one question from earlier. Why is it important to have VM less than V? Oh, it wasn't, it was bad. That was a bad thing to do. Oh. So you mean up here? Why is one, it, yeah. This one here? Uh, well, the problem was, so when I had it like this, okay, the reaction rate on the first one was one. First of all, you have to agree with that, which is just 0.1 times 10, K1, which is 0.1 times 10, which is S1, all right? So 10 times 0.1 is one. So the rate in the first reaction was one. So it'll be one mole per, you know, per liter per second. That's fixed. Doesn't change ever. The problem now is the second reaction, its maximal rate is 0.5, which of course is less than one. Therefore, you're continually injecting something at a rate of one, but only taking it away at a rate of 0.5. That must mean then that S2 will start to climb and climb and climb and climb and climb. And in fact, eventually it just goes to infinity. So I don't know if that answers the, the question. I think the other thing was just in general. So like these oh. are these, like all these rates and stuff are, where are we getting them from? Are we like, how can you have a bug in a constant that is just the truth about the model, right? Uh, because most, because that, because most <laughs> constants are not, don't represent the truth when you when you take them from the literature. They're only estimates, all right? Uh, there are always errors in, in any any literature numbers you get. There'll be errors in them. Sometimes the errors are small. Sometimes the errors are big. Um, in this case, it just could be that you have a you have the right numbers, but the model was bad. And that's why I said, okay, so the literature says that VM2 is definitely 0.5. Okay, well, we can't change that. So there's gotta be something wrong with the model because experimentally, we don't see S2 going to infinity. The solution then was to modify the model to make the first step reversible, okay? Then it worked. So yeah, if you have high confidence in your parameter values, not they're right, okay? and you're still having problems, then it's got to be a model problem. Right, does that answer it? Sounds good to me. Sounds good, yeah. Okay. And the latest question is, what is the difference between steady state functions like steady state versus steady state approximation? Hmm. Uh, that's a very good question. I didn't even <laughs> know this function existed. Uh, oh, I see, okay, okay, I see yes. Um, what this one is, it attempts to find the steady state by running a time course integration. I think I know who put this in. I, I think Kiri put this in because sometimes even the steady state will fail, but you're convinced there is a steady state. Uh, and so you use this thing to try to forcibly find it by running a time course simulation. That's what that's for. So some, like the mathematics aren't working out, but if you just run the model, like yeah. and the and the rates go to zero, then yeah, then like hey, that must be it. Yeah, I'm not sure what would happen if we tried it on an oscillator. Failed to converge. There we go. Oh, that's a decent error message. So it tried to find a steady state for this system using the time cost integration, which it can't do because it's oscillating, and it comes back and says failed to converge while running approximation routine. All right, that makes that makes sense. Okay. Uh, all right, um, so what we're gonna do now is let's go back to the, so that's a bit about the steady state. Um, 
Yeah, so the one thing you may have noticed is that the steady state function uh, returns a number. Okay, there's a number, returns a number. This number tells you how close it thinks it is to the steady state. Anything less than 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus nine means it's, it's close enough to the steady state. This is 10 to the minus 16 is virtually zero. Uh, it found it. So this gives you some idea of how close it is to get to steady state. Now, if you if you ran it and it say it gave you 10 to the minus three, what you can do is you can try and run the steady state function again and it'll try to improve it even further. And sometimes you'll find that it gets, it makes a, it makes a, it can improve it then to uh, a much better degree if you do it two times. So if I would, in fact, in this case, let me see if I, let me try to do it, run it again, okay? And hopefully it'll actually hit probably zero. Come on. No, just, it's 10 times better though. Okay, and in fact, if I do it again, uh, oh no, that's as far as it gets, I guess. Okay, so you can, re if you're having problems finding the steady state, you can repeatedly run it and hope that it'll, it'll get better and better. All right. Okay, um, that's that. All right, so let's have a little bit of theory then on, on the steady state, just a little bit of theory. So, so this is an important state to consider um, for most modelers. It's a good, it's a reference state from which you can then, um, well, you can study the properties of the steady state. You can look at how sensitive the steady state is and, and things like that. Uh, and you can talk about the stability of the steady state. So let's have a look at this, learn a little bit more than about this steady state. So here's a simple model. We have two steps, um, X zero and X one are fixed. Okay, these are gonna be fixed fixed species. Uh, S1 is the floating species. And I'm gonna have very simple rate laws for V1 and V2. V1 is just K1 times X0. And because X0 is fixed, V1 is essentially fixed, okay? Because K1 is fixed. But V2 can vary according to S1, all right? Now, what's nice about this kind of model, this simple model, you can do a graphical representation of the steady state. So what I've got here, I've got the same model, Okay, what I've done is I've drawn the two rates V1 and V2 as a function of S1. Now, of course, V1 doesn't change at all, no matter what S1 is, because V1 is not a function of S1, right? So I get a straight line. Okay, so that represents V1. Now the, the, the sloped lines are the value for V2 are different values of K2. So K2 is the second rate constant on, on, on V2. So I can change V2 and then observe how it, how it alters V2. And I'm getting straight lines, of course, because it's a, it's a, linear, it's a linear expression. But what you notice is that the, the red, green, and orange line, they cross the blue line. So the V2 line crosses the V1 line. Where it crosses is where V1 equals V2. And actually this is the point. So when both rates are equal, we're actually at steady state. And so these crossing points mark the steady state solutions. So if K2 is 3.3, the steady state solution for S1 is about 1.3. If I decrease K2 to 0.2, the steady state goes up to about two. If I incre uh, decrease even further to 0.1, the steady state increases to 0.4. So this is a nice way of depicting the steady state. And you can see that the steady state changes as a function of the uh, rate constant K2, okay? So this is a nice graphical way of representing the steady state. Okay. Um, now we can also, so this is the graphical. So we've got two ways of depicting the steady state. We can do it graphically like this, or we can run, you know, the steady state function, you know, r dot get, you know, r dot steady state. The other way to do it is to actually determine it analytically. So I can do it mathematically. So this is the model for that simple two-step pathway, ds by ds one by dt equals k one x one minus k two s one. Sorry, right? Herbert. Yeah. Um, sorry, is it? Uh, could you explain again why um, v one equals v two is the steady state? Um, oh yeah. I might okay. have missed that. Yeah. No, that's fine. Um, so, 
So you agree that the, the y-axis measures V1 and V2, okay? So anywhere along here, the yeah. blue line is V2. So and anywhere along the red line, sorry, anywhere along the blue line is V1, anywhere along the red line is V2. Where they cross, it must be the case that V1 equals V2. Yeah. So if we go back to, if you look at this equation, actually, this piece here is V1. This piece here is V2, all right? Ah, okay, so, I see now. Yeah, you so when they're yeah. equal, the left-hand side has got to be zero. And so, and that's the definition of steady state. All yep, right, so it makes when, sense. Thank you. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Glad you asked the question. So, so yeah, we can do the same trick that's done here, but analytically, uh, I can set the left-hand side to zero, ds1 dt equals zero, and then I can solve for S1. And if I solve for S1, I get this expression. So this is the analytical expression for the steady state. The other thing I can do is I can work out what's the steady state rate. Uh, that, that's actually a trivial thing in this case, uh, which I'll tell you now. Uh, if I take the solution S1 and insert it into, um, into, this, into this piece here, right? I get this here, which is the rate. Uh, K2 cancels with K2 and I get K1 X1. You know, all it's saying is that the steady state rate must be K1 X1. And of course it has to be that because the rate is fixed. So this pathway has no choice uh, to match. It has, it has no choice at steady state in that the rate, the steady state rate must be V1, all right? So V2, let's say say V2 has to match V1. It basically has no choice in the matter because V1 is basically fixing the steady state rate. Okay, so you can do this analytically. Now for more complicated problems, because you can't do it analytically, um, and uh, you have to re revert to um, simulation, which is why we do it by simulation. Even a three-step pathway, well, let me say a five-step a five pathway with Michaelis mental kinetics, you cannot solve it analytically. All right, so um, you can only do this for really simple systems like this. Is that like literally true? Like the, yeah. the mathematics just can't be done? Can't be done, yeah. Well, what happens okay. is you got a fifth order, fifth order quadratic, which you can't solve. So analytically, I mean. So, um, and it's pages and pages long, actually. <laughs> uh, we did this some years ago. We tried to find solutions to steady state solutions analytically. And it turned out to be a silly idea because uh, you got pages and pages of equations. And when you were above about five variables, you got um, polynomials that had no solution anyway. So that was the end of that. So. Okay, so let me do, let me do, what's the time? So um, 10 past, almost 10 past 10. Uh, I think we'll have another short break. Let's have a, a 10 minute break. Um, and nothing S1, okay? I'm gonna try and draw you, it's not very good, right? So that's the first step. S1 goes to S2. I'm just gonna draw the line, right, without the arrow. So that goes to S2, right? Then S2 goes to, oh, actually this is, sorry, this is the, sorry, I've got to stop. This is the other model. Sorry, this is a much simpler model. This actually is just a linear chain, all right? So actually, let me get the other model instead. I want to get. I want to do the other model first. Sorry about that. Uh, how do I get out? Uh, there. Hold on for a second. Sorry, it was event one. I should use. Sorry. But the, but I can keep the diagram on there, which is nice. Let me just do that. Okay. So let me do that. Okay. So this is better. No scroll up a bit. Okay. This is the one I wanted to do. All right, so what I've got here is X0 going to S1. Uh, S1 goes to S2. S2 goes to, let me put my cursor back on. Uh, annotation. So S2 goes to S3. And then S3 just disappears and I don't care where it goes, okay? Then I have S1 going to S4, okay, S4. Whoops, that's not a very good four. Then I got S4 branching off, going off to nowhere. So you might, this is sort of a branch system, okay? And what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna use events 
to switch these branches on and off, right? So this is how you would model, say, let's say you had a metabolic pathway and you knew that either at a certain time or when a certain concentration reached a certain level, uh, a certain enzyme turned on or off, okay? So I'm gonna represent the enzyme just by using um, K1. I'm gonna pretend that K1, K2, K3, K4, those are the, that's the amount of enzyme, okay? I'm just gonna pretend that. And I've, what I've got down here is a set of events that will trigger, two of them trigger depending on time. So when time is greater than eight, it'll switch off K1. So it switches that off, all right? Uh, time greater than 20, it'll turn it back on, all right? The other thing I have here is when S2 exceeds 0.7, it makes K3 much less. So maybe the expression for the enzyme in step three, and step three is uh, S, this one here. The expression for that step you know, greatly reduces. And then the other one, this is a flux. So here I'm saying, if the flux through J5, through this step exceeds a certain value, um, I'm going to also reduce K5 to a, a much lower value. So you could do all sorts of things with events like this. And there's a lot more to events than this. And you should look at the documentation. You can do quite a lot of sophisticated things with the events, uh, like you have delayed events. You can have lots of things happening. I could turn off an entire section of a pathway and I'll do that uh, next time in, in shortly. But let's have a look to see what happens when I run this one, okay? So, um, so I'm doing another trick here actually. Uh, <clears throat> let me get rid of this help. I'm doing another trick here. So I'm running a simulation, right? And I want to just plot all the reaction fluxes. I don't want to plot the species levels. And so what I'm doing here is another trick you can do. I'm putting time in the first column, then I'm adding the list of all the reaction names, okay? Um, then I'm doing the plot, then I'm going to reset and then I'm gonna plot all the floating species, okay? So let's just run this and see what happens. So I'm getting two plots, okay? One plot are for the fluxes and the other plot is for the species. And all this complicated behavior is coming about as a result of these events firing one after the other, either in time or depending on whether uh, a flux re exceeds a limit or a species concentration exceeds a limit. Or you can do, a, you know, a concentration is less than some number or, or a collection of species are above or below something. You can have whatever expression you like in here. You can test as many things as you like, and then you can fire off whatever thing, whatever event you want as a result. So this shows, you know, some complicated behavior. So why don't I, let me make a copy of this. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna make a copy of this and I'll show you what happens if I wanted to, let's say I wanted to turn off, let's say when S2, so let me, let's get rid of those. When S1, which is this intermediate here, let's say when S1 reaches some, let me see, let me go back to the previous. When S1 say reaches two, I'm gonna switch off all the steps in the upper arm. So I'm gonna switch off uh, K2, K3, and K4, all right? So when S2 exceeds two, right? I'm gonna switch off K1, so I'm gonna set that to zero. I'm gonna switch off K2, zero. And no, I don't wanna switch off K1, do I? I'm gonna switch off K2. Basically, I want all the flux now to, to go down to S4. I'm gonna set K3 to zero. Then I'm going to set four to zero. So I'm basically switching off the entire upper arm. Okay. So let's run that and see what happens. Um, doesn't look very exciting. Actually, actually, that's something not quite right there. Is there? What happened there? S2. Oh, I see. Uh, S2 actually never gets to two. So the event is never actually fired. So let's bring it down to say 1.2. Okay. Okay. Now we do it. Uh, S1 is still not fired. Okay. Am I doing something wrong here or what? Oh, that's better. Okay. 
So, um, so if S1 is ever, ever gets, if it ever gets greater than 0.9, I'm going to switch off this upper arm here. Okay. And so you can see here uh, the fluxes are just dropping to zero in the upper arm and the concentrations, well, they actually probably did go up a little bit, but they stay, they basically drop back down to zero. So by using events, uh, you could do some, you know, clever tricks by turning on and off things. Uh, make things happen uh, depending on the conditions. Um, so let's now look at the other one. The other one is another example I did, uh, events two. Question? Yeah. Why did they go back to zero? Because you turned everything off. That should mean they should stay constant, shouldn't they? Uh, no, but they drain out through S3. Didn't you set that to zero as well? Uh, oh, did I? Oh yes, what I what I think is happening is that the values are so small that they're not registering. So, what I'm going to do is that's a good question. But I'm going what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to plot uh, S and S three and see what happens. I think the values are just very small. Oops, no, what did I do? I made a mistake. Uh, oh, square brackets. There you go. Uh, yeah, right. What's happening there? There should be something. Mm, that is odd, isn't it? Mm, let me tell you, let me, let me do this. I'm going to um, up this a bit, right? And then I'm going to up this a bit, try and get more, more material flowing through the pathway. Oh, there we go. Okay, I think the numbers were just too small. Um, so uh, now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to reduce this back to let's reduce that back to ten, so you can see what's happening. Okay, doesn't really help much, but so um, these things uh, reach a constant value. Although I don't see <laughs> the problem now is the two simulations are different times. Yeah. So what's happening? This is what happens when you do examples on the fly. Um, so what's happening here is that S1 never exceeds five and S, yeah, and I suspect that's, so if I do S1 here, and I think S1 never exceeds, yeah, it gets to four. Um, yeah, I'd have to then go back below, f maybe before three, maybe. Uh, that doesn't work either. You were pointing at S2, not S1. What's that? Sorry, I didn't hear that. You were pointing at S2, not S1. Yeah, S2 is the one that goes up to four, not S1. Oh. Oh, yeah. S1 just stays down at 0, 0.0, whatever. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's too much then. No, S1 never gets anywhere close to four. It's S2 that goes up to four. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Well, let me see if this makes a difference. Uh, it's not really helping. No, the, the S1 doesn't reach 0.5 either. It, it barely gets above like 0.01. <laughs> I like 0 0.01. Wow, what's so, why does it not get up very high? It's because this thing is dra It's because this it lower pulls step it out so fast. Is pulls it out so fast. Yes. Maybe if I drop that down a bit. Um, yeah, no, it's. It's yeah, the, the this also, lower K2, arm. The Sorry? K2 is really high. K2 is really, yeah. I, I was hoping to okay, divert totally. a lot of stuff into the upper arm initially. So it gets, you know, we'd get concentrations in the upper arm, and then I would switch it off, and then they would just stay there then. Um, but it's not quite what's happening. You're not going to stay because S3 goes to nothing. Oh, you know, you're setting K4 to zero, right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. I'm setting K4 to zero. For the same um, example, you could set at S2 greater than four or three, because that should work then. Uh, okay. Yeah. S2, not S4. Sorry. There yeah. you go. That might be better. <laughs> well, it's actually switching here now. <laughs> and. <clears throat> 
Okay, so I need to let me remove S1 because that's dominating the dynamics there. <clears throat> and then we'll see what happens. God, they've got this <laughs> zero. Well, if you work at this long enough, ladies and gentlemen, you will get it to work. Um, so uh, never do unplanned demos because you can never get the thing to work. But the idea is if you were to design this, uh, if you were to think about this long enough, you'd probably be able to <clears throat> arrange an event so that you would switch flux at a certain point from the lower, you know, you'd switch off the upper arm so you can move everything into the lower arm, all right? Um, yeah, uh, maybe this, this can be an exercise for you to do to see if you can get this thing to work. Uh, so this demo is in the uh, folder so you can play with it if you want to, okay? All right, uh, we've got, 15 minutes left because then I got to go to another talk. So the last thing I want to do is um, talk about parameter scanning. Let me just clear the, uh, how do I, how do I clear the, clear, here we go, clear, 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 there we go. Um, last thing I wanted to do, and I don't think it's, oh, I'm not sure if it's how important it is actually, but um, oh yeah, this is one thing I do want to I want to talk about is solving ODEs. So sometimes you'll get a model where all they've given you is actually the ODEs. You know what do you do? You could try to reverse engineer it back to the original you know reaction set model, but maybe you can't. And so we provide a, a facility to actually write ODEs directly into Roadrunner. Okay, so I can go T I can go T E load A. Oops. Uh, and I'll, whoops, put that in, oops. Put that in there. And let's solve a very simple uh, 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 exponential decay, all right? So the way you do that, and I think somebody mentioned it yesterday, uh, if you want to specify differential equation, you write it like this. So the, the, the prime or the little, <clears throat> the little thing there tells it that <clears throat> X, this equation, is a differential equation, okay? And so then I can initialize things just as I do before. There's no, no difference there. Uh, I can make that point 0.1. And then I can just run the simulation just as I do before. There's no change here at all. Um, 0, 20, 100. And uh, it won't surprise you that if you run this, uh, you get an exponential decay, okay? So if I run it for a bit longer, perhaps, uh, you get an exponential decay, all right? Now, that's a pretty uninteresting model. A far more interesting one, of course, is the Lorentz attractor. So this is a, those of you who know a bit about chaos and are interested in that kind of thing, you'll like this. Uh, so this model has three differential equations. It's supposed to be a very, very, very simple model. I mean, I mean, when I say very, I mean, very to the power of 10. A uh, very, very simple model of the weather. <laughs> And these three variables are meant to represent different aspects of the weather, such as temperature, pressure, and so on. Um, this was developed many, long, many, many, many years ago by somebody called Lorentz, uh, who passed away recently, I believe. But what was interesting about this model, it was the first model to show uh, chaotic behavior. I mean, chaotic behavior had been suspected before this, but it never had been, had been, in, had been seen as clearly as this. And you can't really turn this into a reaction scheme. It's not it isn't a reaction scheme, it's, it's a weather model. Uh, and so you, in this case, you really want to just type it in as a set of differential equations, all right? If you go to Wikipedia, you can just copy and paste this system directly into, into uh, Tellurium like this. You can set up the initial conditions, you can set up the um, parameter values, and then you can do a simulation, okay? So I'll run this. Those of you like, you know, chaos and things, you'll appreciate this. They're the three trajectories, X, Y, Z. Now, you might be saying, well, this looks pretty regular. Why are you saying it's chaotic? Well, what I can do is I can do a phase plot like this. I can just plot X versus Y. And you get a strange looking diagram like this. I don't have enough points there, so let me put in more points. You can see some of the jaggy edges. So that's much, much smoother. In fact, let me drop it down a bit, perhaps to, to, yeah, that's a bit too, not, that's a bit too much. Um, so this is a special trajectory. It's actually 
I'm only I'm, it's a projection of a 3D plot, and because because we have three variables, it's not possible for. Yeah, if you think about it, it makes sense. But no line, no line here can cross another line. Right? It's not possible for a trajectory line here to actually cross over another line. So every line here is unique. And that means that these trajectories never ever repeat themselves. So they're always different. And so this is one of the this is one characteristic of cha chaotic behavior. Um, let me put, bring back time here again. Maybe you can see these a bit more detail. Uh, well, not that one, maybe Z. Uh, you can see it there. So we let, this is just to show you that we let people um, type the differential equations in directly. This is easier than trying to use ODE int or something like that from the Python SciPy package. You can just type this in directly. And this is fully SPML compatible. You can save this model in SPML. You can load it into something like Copasi or whatever, and it'll run the same way, all right? Because Copasi recognizes the same um, kind of models in SPML. All right? So I just wanted to show you this. This is a way of doing ODEs. Yeah, somebody asked for PDEs. Sadly not, no. Of course, you can fake PDEs by doing lots and lots of species, uh, one after the other. Um, but you can sort of fake it that way. And if I've done that once, uh, it sort of works, but it's a bit tedious to do, to write it all out. Although one could imagine writing a script that automatically constructs that kind of grid for you. So you could have a sort of fake PD and it, it would work. Uh, in fact, it does work. So yeah, if I've done uh, a 1D diffusion uh, by modeling, I had about a hundred species all connected in the linear chain and you can have a sort of 1D simulation. So each species represents a volume element <clears throat> and the concentration then is the concentration of that volume element. Um, but you're probably better off using other, other tools if you want to uh, for that kind of thing. All right, and the last thing then is before we end for the morning is- One parameters. quick question about like oh, just yeah. combining re reactions and ODEs directly. Yeah, and, you can do that, yeah. yeah. Uh, the only issue is that just like um, like if you have x prime equals something and x appears in a reaction, you must make x a, a boundary species, x or, or the fixed dollar sign there. But I presume the, the yeah. floating species can appear in the right-hand side of the- Yeah, they, you can appear in the right-hand side of the equation yeah. all you like. Uh, yeah. Just if, if, you're, if you are setting the ch rate of change of x, you can't have it also be changed by a reaction. Right. Yeah, you can't have the two models trying to change the same variable at the same time. Right. Right. right? You can't do that. But as so long as they separate it out, they can interact with each other by entering them, entering each by by finding by by putting those concentrations into the right hand side of the equations. Right. So you, you can do that. And sometimes you you know that can be useful. Um is there a difference between external cons? That's a good question. I think it's one for Lucian. Uh, the answer is no, not for species. Oh, um, like X is a sort of a special term for species in particular, but yeah, const. I mean, for species, I actually don't. It, 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 oh, I the antimony does not let does not let you like act literally fixed a something to be constant constant uh, fix the species to be constant just to be a boundary species which means it can change from uh, an ode reaction rate or a or a fix or assignment rule yeah a sine um, wave like a sine but wave the other thing you, you can use const for anything you can make a, a parameter constant you can make a uh, we haven't talked about um compartments but you can make compartments constant or not etc so this is the last thing i want to do then uh just briefly mention parameter scanning i said this is one area that uh could be improved i mean of course you can do whatever parameter scanning you want because you just have to write the python scripts all right but it would be nice if you had some sort of package that would you know do this for you this for example this is this shows you um a parameter scan. I got a, a simple model again, just two steps. And I'm going to be changing K1. Each time I change K1, I'm going to run a simulation. Okay. 
So this is really awkward, as you can see. It, you know, it takes a lot just to do that, something simple like this. But what it's doing is it runs one simulation then it starts a loop. And each time it runs through the loop, it changes K1 and, a, and, a, and appends, basically it horizontally appends the result of a new simulation onto the existing simulation. And then it plots the whole thing using a plot array. So if I run this, uh, you'll, you'll see this kind of plot. So the loop changes K1, one, two, three, four, five times or so. Each time it changes K1 a little bit from 0.4 to 0.8 and each time it plots it out. If I were to look at the data, that the, the, the numbers that are coming out here in M, what you'll see is, uh, actually, what you'll see here is, let me hold on. What you see, what it's done is, oh, except it's not showing it. Um, all right, what it's done is, this is, this is constructed one column at a time. So the first column is time. And then the second, third, and fourth, fifth columns are S1, but at different K1s, all right? That's what it's done. Uh, as you can see, it's not, not the prettiest thing to do. Um, um, maybe there are cleverer ways of doing it with Python, but uh, you could do it. Um, I did, I have a, uh, in the TUtils, I do have a parameter scanning thing for doing just simple scans. So if I take this um, and put this in here, um, where is it, come on, down here, um, call parameter scanning. And there's only one call, a simple time course scan. You need to pass it a roadrunner, the, the model, and then the parameter you want to scan, the thing you want to observe, the range over which K1 is changing, and then the time. You know, when does the time end? Um, and this is any format you want for the legend. Um, so if you run that, I just have to change this. Um, and it will work. Um, hold on. Oh, it just gave me the data, did it? No, okay. Let me, uh, oh, okay. what did it do? Hmm, it's not plotting. Oh, what is it doing? In the in your previous cell, did you have a plotting thing? No. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Okay. Oh. All right. Okay. Well, okay. I don't know what happened there. Anyway, it'll plot as well. It'll do the scan and make the plot, and I guess it returns the results in M. So you could do something like this, but it's not very. It's not satisfactory because it's not. You can't. It's not generalizable. It's very specific to this one particular thing. I mean, you can do one clever trick uh, with it, which I'll show here. Um, where is it here? Oh, this, well, yeah, this one. So this one, for example, shows an os oscillation and I'm scanning, I'm changing the hill coefficient in here. And each time I change the hill coefficient, I do a plot and it merges them all together for me. And it plots me the, um, how the, how the time course changes, how the oscillations change as I change the hill coefficient, right? So at hot, low hill coefficients, there's no oscillations. At high hill coefficients, you get oscillations. So, you know, you can do things like that. But there's one, I suppose, cute thing you can do with it. Uh, oh, where did it go? Oh, it must be down. Oh, it's in here. It's in the exercises here. So it's this thing here. So let me copy this to it. Um, We've got a few minutes uh, before I have to go. Oops, sorry, wrong one. Um, here it is here. So what I've got here, I'm using the parameter scanning call again, but I've got two loops, an inner loop and an outer loop. So the inner loop will scan, will, will look at all the species and the outer loop we we'll look at all the parameters. So this will give me, so I've got one, two, three, four, four, Five, uh, four parameters and three species. So this will actually give me 12, 12 sets of plots, all right? So if I, uh, each time it does a scan, it then, it then shows it, okay, to make sure it, show, it makes it visible. So if I run this, you'll, you'll see what I mean. So it's generating them all now. So for example, so generate a whole load. So this one is for S1. This shows how S1 changes as I change K1. This one shows how S2 changes as I K1. This shows how K3 changes how I K change K1. Then it switches to K2. 
So this shows how Ks1 changes to the K2, S2, S3, then it switches to K3 on S1, S2, S3, and then finally K4 uh, on S1, S2, and K3. So you can do things like that, but it's not very satisfactory. And it's something, you know, if anybody wants to write a little package for us, be free, <laughs> feel free to do so. Something that would help uh, people do parameter scans. Uh, obviously, you can do it now. You can write, you know, whatever scripts you want. But uh, and for simple basic things, you can use use the utilities function, uh, the tutils, uh, this thing here, to do parameter scanning. But it'd be nice if you had something a bit more sophisticated um, to make things easier for people to do. As otherwise, you probably you know you're reduced to doing. Um, scripts like like that i mean it's possible but uh, uh becomes a bit of a nuisance all right any questions on there uh, because i think we've come to the end then for this for session one so session two this afternoon will be uh professor joe hellstein uh he's going to give a very interesting um session on parameter fitting i think you'll find that really interesting um and there's lots of demos and stuff he has. So it'll be quite interesting to listen to that. Any other questions now? Yeah, I had a question, but without pushing too much into the uh, negative values that the, the variables can take. Oh, yeah. um, can, can we use the conditions like the events for restricting, for instance, like ah. if this is, uh, reaches zero, then- uh, That's the a very good question. I like that question um, because that's a very tempting thing to do. So mm -hmm. what she's asking is, you know, there are negative concentrations in my model. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use an event to watch for those negative concentrations. And if they occur, presumably you're going to set it to zero or some positive number. That's a very tempting thing to do. Um, but what you're doing is you're hiding a deeper problem. Uh, you can do that, right? And the program will run, and it'll do what you tell it to do. It'll it'll keep those concentrations from going negative. But what it's hiding is some problem with your model. Mm, I understand. Okay. Uh, so I don't I don't recommend doing that. Uh, as tempting as it is, um, I remember in the early simulators. You know, when I was much younger than I am now, and some of my colleagues as well. We, we used to think that we think we thought, yeah, yeah, we'll prevent negative concentrations. We'll just watch for negative concentrations. If they happen, we'll just, you know, set them to zero. But we realized pretty quickly afterwards that was the wrong thing to do mm -hmm. uh, because it's basic because we realized the, the reason why it was going negative was because we built the model incorrectly. So, yeah, I wouldn't do that unless you have a really, really good reason to do it. So it's a, basically it's a really good diagnostic tool for looking yeah. at your results. Yeah. I understand. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Otherwise, we'll uh, retire for lunch and then back in an hour or so. <laughs>